Hey everyone, welcome to Johnny How To. In this video, we're going to continue our tracking series. If you haven't seen video one, which was one point compositing for stabilization and match moving, please go ahead and check that. I'll put that down in the description below. This video is going to focus on two point tracking, which can compensate for movement in the X and Y axis for rotation and scale of the camera as well. So in this case, we're going to be taking this handheld footage of this boy climbing up this mountain and uh, in the final composite, which we're not going to do the whole composite here, he's supposed to be climbing up this mountain going towards this opening right here. Assuming they didn't have a tripod or the placement of the camera, they didn't have access to be able to use a tripod there. So they handheld it. They shot it with a pretty fast shutter speed, so there's not a whole lot of motion blur. You can see there is some DV artifact, and this is older footage. But they wanted to stabilize this, obviously, so it could fit in with the static shot of him climbing up this mountain terrain right here. So let's go and talk about how we can track this and how we can get the best results out the gate. So first off, like with one point tracking or however many points tracking you're doing, contrast is the main thing it's looking for. It's looking for a pattern and it's looking for contrast to follow over the duration of the shot. Now this shot is 500 frames long. I'm not going to do the entire shot. Maybe I'll do like 200 frames just to keep down the time a little bit. So if I go and look at the color channels here, red, I'll go in full screen space bar, red, green, blue. As far as the lightest areas and the darkest areas, it looks like the red channel has the most contrast. The blue channel does have some strong contrast in these areas, but I think the red channel is probably going to work pretty well for us. And remember, so we're just trying to take out the camera movement out of this shot. We're not trying to follow along with the boy or anything, so we don't want to have the trackers on the boy. We want it on static objects that don't change over time, and that way we're going to be able to either match the camera or take the movement out of the camera. So let's go ahead and start that process. So first off, I'm gonna go ahead and shuffle everything to the red channel since we've established that has the most contrast. So I'm gonna select the footage, press tab, and add a shuffle node. And inside this node to shuffle everything to the red channel. So this is what comes in, this is what goes out. I'm just gonna make all the channels, green is green right now, blue is blue right now. I'm gonna make all the color channels just to the red channel. So if I press RGB, and you can see the channels are changing up here, RGB, it's just the same color. So I'm gonna press B again or whatever channel I'm on to go back to the uh, RGB, and you can see it's all just that one particular color channel. So I've shuffled to the red channel. I'm gonna go ahead and name this label just R for red, so I know that's what I'm on, or what I shuffled to. And now I'm gonna go ahead and end my tracker node after this. This is not to say you couldn't get a good result not doing the shuffle and just tracking the footage itself, but if you try and get as good a contrast as you can out the gate, you're probably going to be set up for better results and less frustrating troubleshooting and things like that. So the tracker node itself, I don't have any tracker dialog on screen yet. That's because I need to click on add track. And now I get the little tracking dialog box right here. So we are going to do a two point track, but we're only gonna do one track at a time. So I'm just gonna start off with this first one. And uh, what I want to do before I get started is I wanna make sure that I'm choosing points where the boy doesn't walk. So if I say I started off tracking this spot right here, I thought that was a good, nice, contrasty spot, which it is, as soon as he hits that area, it's gonna throw off the track, and it's not gonna be able to follow that point anymore, obviously, and my track's gonna go all haywire and mess up and everything. So the points you choose are important, and you wanna, in this case, I wanna make sure to choose points that he's not going to intersect and uh, travel in front of and uh, obstruct. So I'm thinking probably that I'm gonna choose a spot maybe around here. The other thing worth mentioning is you don't wanna to track too far away from the person because, or from the object. So remember, things that are further away from you seem like they're moving slower and things that are in the foreground seem like they're moving more quickly. So the example I would always give in class is if you're driving down the freeway and we were in California, so driving down the freeway, those little poles on the side of the freeway go by really, really fast, right? The cactuses in California, they're off in the distance a little bit or going by a little bit slower in the mountains, way far in the back, aren't going by very fast because they're so far off. It's not that they're not moving at the same rate, but perceivably from your perspective and where you're at, it looks like they're moving more slowly. So with that being said, I want to track things that are on the same general plane as where the boy is. I'm not going to use this entire shot when it's comped into the actual final shot. I'm just going to use a section of it, but I want it to be stable around where the boy is moving, so I want to make sure to track points around that. So that being said, I'll probably track a point around here, and I'll probably track a point up around here because he doesn't move in front of those spots, and they're relatively around where he moves. So I'm going to go ahead and move this guy Maybe up to around here. 
And remember with the tracker node, you don't want to use the viewer controls. You can play forward and back here, but it's not going to actually keyframe everything. You have to use your tracker controls here. And I am on frame one. And like I said, I'm probably only going to track about 200 frames. There's no reason to make you guys sit throughout the entire duration. So I'm going to go, use, go ahead and use the tracker range right here. And I'll click on that. That's going to let me define a range that I want to track. So I'll just do from one to 200. I'll go ahead and do a step of one, meaning it's going to track every frame. I'll go ahead and let it do its business, and I'll just watch this and see and make sure that it doesn't jump and sway from that particular spot. And so far, so good. It looks like it went through the entire duration and stuck to that point really nice and solidly. Uh, Noob does have a very nice tracker, so you don't have to worry about it too much, as long as you pick good spots, plan appropriately. All right, so that's my track one. I'm going to go ahead and add another track. And this one's already been tracked, so I'm going to unenable this because I don't want to track that again. I already monitored that and made sure that was good. I don't want to track it again. So I'm going to disable that just for now. I'm going to focus on my second track. I'm going to go ahead and move this down probably to somewhere around here that looks like a pretty good pattern that's going to follow. So remember the inner square is the pattern it's trying to follow. So everything around here, not just this point, but everything around here is going to try and follow from frame to frame. And this outside square is how far it's allowed to look from frame to frame. Since it's not a super jittery shot as far as how far it moves from frame to frame, I probably don't need to make this outer square too large. Um, but you might need to adjust it as you're going through just to make sure you get good results. So I think that'll probably work fine. I'm on frame 200 going backwards this time around, so I'll go ahead and track the range backwards, and I'll say from 200 to 1, and the step is negative 1, meaning it's going to go one frame at a time backwards. So I'll go and go OK. I'll make sure and watch this and make sure it's tracking correctly. And I'm, I'm expecting this probably going to stick pretty well. So far it looks like it is. And there we go, now we're done. So I'll maybe go through and just double check and make sure this stuck quite well, which looks like it did. And I think we're all set. No special uh, conditions we need to do in this particular time around. All right, so I'm gonna use the slightly more eloquent solution in using this track. And instead of unplugging this track and just plugging it directly into the footage and saying, I want to stabilize it or match move it, I'm gonna use a little bit different method that's going to give me a little bit more flexibility. And that's having the node create a tracker node for me with those numbers piped into it. So from the drop down here, remember in this case, I wanna stabilize the footage. So I'm gonna select transform stabilize. And when I click on create, it's created a transform node, just like I would do if I clicked in the node graph and pressed T for transform but it's actually piping in these numbers. You can see from this green arrow right here, it's taking the numbers that it has right here and piping them into the X and Y coordinates and the rotation and everything else in here. And when I plug this into the footage, now I can use this here and if I ever change anything, say the track is off, it's automatically going to update and send the numbers, the updated numbers over to here and basically like streaming them over there. Now the one thing that I wanna talk about is I already had these checked, but when you want to lock down multiple properties. So right now in track one, it's enabled. I re-enabled that and I have it using the translation, the X and Y coordinates. And if I press play, you can see that in this particular spot, if I'm viewing this stabilization node, it's gonna try and lock down the movement from for that particular spot. But it's not locking down the rotation and scale. And in order to lock those properties down, you have to use two points, and that's why I track two different points. So if you think about it, if you have a point in space, like say this space right here, or this spot right here, and I track that, it can lock down that movement, and it won't vary from that spot. But as soon as there's rotation in the camera move, it's going to rotate around that point. So say you stuck your finger, say this was a picture and you stuck your finger on that and you rotated, well, it's gonna rotate around that spot so the image is still rotating. Or say that the image is scaling. So if I have that one spot, I don't know if that point's getting bigger or smaller, at least the software doesn't. But if you go through the process of tracking two points, what happens if these two points and the software's comparing it and they're both rotating like this. Well, it knows that the points are actually rotating. If these two points are getting closer together or starting to converge, that means that the camera is getting further away. And if these two points are getting further apart from each other, that means that the camera is getting closer. So once you have two points, you can lock down both translation, rotation, and scale. 
Now, just because you can check these boxes doesn't mean you always should, because in this case, the camera is not really moving aside from rotation and translation. If I check the scale, it might introduce errors that I don't actually want. So long story short, if I press play now and go ahead and close out this dialog, and I'll close down these guys and I'll go full screen here. It does look like it's shaking around a little bit, but if I hover over this spot right here on the mountainside, you can see that it's actually sticking and it's not really rotating. So what I'm seeing or what you're seeing kind of as far as the uh, the, the funkiness and the kind of the, the pixelation is just the DV footage. And then also there might be a slight amount of motion blur in the footage as well. And you unfortunately you can't take out motion blur. So that's kind of built in the shot. But now we do see that our shot is basically locked down. And if you weren't sure if that was working or not, if we go ahead and view our original playback. And we'll go ahead and just do this little section right here. You can see it's quite shaky. Actually, let's go ahead and do a side by side. So I'll press one here, I'll press two here, and in the viewer, I'll press W for wipe. And I can wipe between these two. If I zoom in and play this back, you can see that one side, this side, is very shaky, whereas this side is locked down through our stabilization. So we can compare and see that this actually is working for us. So the filmmakers were actually smart when they shot this because they knew that this could be stabilized as long as they use the fast shutter speed. And once you comp this into the shot, so let's just, I mean, I'm not gonna do the whole comp, but let's just go ahead and merge this on top of the map, the really cool map painting they did right here. And we'll just go ahead and do a transform and shrink this down. And if I just use a very small part of this footage, like say just the area where he's walking around and I find some nice splice lines where I can match it in and uh, just kind of blend it in there, it will look pretty convincing from a full screen viewpoint that it looks pretty solid and it's not moving around that much. I'm not going to color correct and splice it in there maybe in a future video if you guys feel like you'd like to see that, I can go ahead and do that. But that's kind of the process where you can do a two point track for stabilization, but just as easily I could change this from transform, stabilize to match move and match the rotation scale. And I'll probably do some other videos on two point tracking as well, just because it's very flexible. But hopefully this gives you an idea on how this works and how you can use it in shots, whether you have handheld footage, you wanna have stabilized, or you wanna be able to take out rotation. You could just take out the rotation and leave the translation. So you can just uncheck these translation boxes. And this is going to keep the translation of the shot, but it's just not gonna rotate anymore. So you can selectively choose how you want things to work and really, really get a nice result, very specific to your needs. All right, so hopefully this is helpful to you. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next Johnny How To.